Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you have ever wanted your public policy decisions to be optimized by artificial intelligence, if you have ever wanted your public policy to be driven by historical economic data personalized to your specific preferences and made transparent and highly collaborative, then this is the session for you. Good morning. My name is Emily Weber. I am a machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services. And our session is called Effective Policies. We're going to be understanding a new technology that is being developed. Uh, and this is an open source project, as we'll quickly discover, uh, looking for academic collaboration and a technical and scientific conversation to understand the best, best ways to develop methodologies related to this important question. And I'm joined here today by some excellent folks who have been helping in, in capacity. So our agenda for this session, first we're going to learn about data-driven public policy analysis. Uh, we're going to be combining classic economic methods, such as randomized control trials, and using them to influence reinforcement learning algorithms. So we're combining these two methods. After that, we're going to take a walk through the architecture of our system. Uh, our agent is named Pareto, after the Italian economist. We're going to look at a quick demo of Pareto, our reinforcement learning state policy generator. We'll talk about applications in both policy and industry, and we'll close with a call to action. And to be overly clear, uh, this is a soon-to-be open-sourced research project. We are actively looking for collaboration with technical and scientific experts across disciplines because we think this is a really important idea. Uh, we want to air these opinions um, so that we can have conversations about the best way to design intelligent systems that can potentially be unbiased politically. So first, data-driven public policy analysis. So Thomas Jefferson tells us that the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only legitimate object of good government. This is an ambitious goal. This is a laudable goal. This is a goal that I think many individuals in the room and elsewhere can get behind. It's, it's easy to support this idea. It's easy to say that we support this idea. But how do we do this practically? Uh, how do we get down to the nuts and bolts of determining objectively what this means across a variety of disciplines and perspectives. On top of that, how do we scale that? How do we make this fast, efficient, objective? So a quick look at global population since, since, since the, the time of human history. So we're looking at 600 BC. So when Lao Tzu uh, was writing some of his first work, we had 280 million humans on the planet. At the time of Thomas Jefferson, we had 722 million humans on the planet. When Napoleon uh, was, was um, making headway in, in Europe, we had one billion humans. We reached our first billion population. Now, in 2019, we are on the upside of seven billion humans on the planet. And so this is a challenging task, you know, particularly for the builders in the room, for the dreamers in the room. How do we optimize our public policy? How do we leverage the entire extent of technology that is available to us, both from the data management and data engineering side and from the artificial intelligence side? How do we design intelligent public policy using machine learning? But public policy is tough, <laughs> right? Let's, let's just understand some systematic issues, some systematic challenges. And these challenges are going to be faced by any individual who is thinking about public policy, regardless of their opinion. So first, we have structured inefficiency, right? The way the United States was actually put together um, way back in the day, uh, the intention was to slow down uh, government decision making, right? It was actually to prevent negative decisions from having a bad impact on the population of that country. And so the intention was for government to be inefficient in order to prevent negative action. And so that makes it challenging when we want to have efficient, optimal outcomes. 
there are also conflicting goals, right? There are, there are conflicting goals that are built into the system, and this is a core part of how the democratic process actually operates and actually runs. And those are good things, right? That's how that we can uh, air opinions and how we can make decisions about what is, what is best to do. But again, when specific agencies are, have conflict, and not just agencies, but any action, any agent uh, in a political system, um, there, there are just conflicting goals, and that's just a part of the process. It is very challenging to synthesize information, right? And this is a challenge that every organization faces when you're looking at the historical data from your own operations, and then you're also combining that with economic data that's available, for example, from the US Census. Uh, it's very challenging to design systems to automatically incorporate this, where we're living in a world where there's a wealth of information, there's significantly more information out there uh, than, than individual people can actually incorporate and that we can synthesize into actionable results. And then lastly, leadership turnover is fast, right? And that's, that's just another part of, of living in an elected, uh, elected official world where every four to eight years um, in, some, in some areas, um, you'll see a complete turnover of the individuals who are leading those groups, and that's a part of democratic process. But again, um, particularly for the folks who are coming from a commercial background, right, it's really challenging to do very much from a substantial and sustaining standpoint when the leadership turnover is so quick. So those are some challenges. Uh, a few schools of thought that exist in order to make those challenges easier, right? So first off, um, we have the, the theory-driven the theory world, so in the international school of, of public relations, we're going to talk about concepts like realism or liberalism, where we're, we're modeling states as international actors who are trying to maximize rational, um, rational power, if you will, rational control. Uh, we'll contrast that with liberalist schools. Uh, where the goal is to actually build out international communities of collaboration in order to reduce negative outcomes. The goal in the theory-driven world is to come up with an optimal theory, but even in the best cases, um, theorists will understand that the best theory is really only get, gonna get you about 80% of the way. It's really never gonna be able to cover all observations that you're gonna see. And in the game theory world, uh, we're gonna be pulling from, pulling from game theoretic frameworks, and then frequently we'll uh, start with philosophical foundations that we're gonna understand in a little bit, and then we'll apply a game theoretic framework to various highly specific public policy challenges. So if we're looking at two, uh, two politicians who are vying for a specific body of votes, um, you can actually apply a game theoretic framework to that, and this is very, very common um, to understand how a sp specific political agent might change their opinion or their stance in order to sway part of the voting body. And when you're uh, thinking from a uh, economic rationalist standpoint, that's actually what they should do, right? That's actually them acting in a rational behavior. Uh, but that's, that's, again, challenging, challenging from an optimal standpoint. And then lastly, in the data-driven world, uh, we're gonna be pulling from classic economics, and we're gonna dive into this in a second here, uh, where we're pulling the data that's relevant for a specific economic policy, and what we wanna do is be able to <coughs> estimate the impact of that specific policy, and this can be very powerful, this can be very effective, but the challenge with all of these schools of thought is that they're incredibly difficult to scale. It's incredibly challenging to make this independent of not just political ideas, but also of policies, right? What if we had a single technical and scientific method that could be applied for a whole host of policies, right? Where you can literally loop through any policy that you're interested in and that you have data for and apply the same core methodology. So data-driven public policy analysis. This brings us to a topic that's known as causal inference. Uh, and when we're looking at causal inference, uh, essentially we're gonna come down to a counterfactual analysis and intuitively we want to know what would have happened if the treatment had not been applied. And in this case, our treatment is a specific policy, so a decision that was made by state legislature, for example, and we wanna know what the impact of that was. And so what we wanna be able to do is convince ourselves that the two groups were nearly identical otherwise. So this means that we're gonna break out our population into a treatment 
and a control group. So let's look at the state of Illinois and we'll compare it with the state of New York. And both of those are broken up into two different time periods, right? So there's the time period before the policy occurred, but then there's also the time period after the policy occurred. And in this difference in difference estimation, which is what this is called, we're gonna look at outcomes before the treatment, and then we'll compare that with outcomes after the treatment. And you can see that both in this hypothetical example, Illinois and New York are starting at 100, but then after the treatment, New York is at 100, but Illinois somehow jumps up to 250. And so what we want to understand in the economics world is what caused that, right? What physical mechanism actually contributed to that difference in outcomes? And the way we do this very commonly, uh, not in every case, but very commonly, is run a regression, right? And the, the machine learning folks in the room should certainly know the word regression, although in this case, we're gonna be applying it slightly differently. So rather than just getting a numerical outcome, we care a lot about the covariates. We care a lot about the importance of our features. And so in this case, why? is an outcome. It's any type of outcome that we care about, whether that's income, um, access to education, longevity, a whole host of outcomes. Then we're gonna use a large number of, in econ we call these covariates. These are features in machine learning. These are variables. These are data attributes. Really any X's, right? When you've got your spreadsheets, uh, the, X, the columns are the X's. Right, and the rows are the people. And so we'll use as many X's as we can, but in particular, there's one column that we care the most about, and that one column is a binary indicator, so it's ones and zeros, for a person being in the treatment group. So the person being in the state of Illinois. And then after we run the regression, what we're gonna do is look at that beta. We're gonna look at the coefficient on that covariate. And we wanna understand, did the treatment cause this difference? And it, it's fairly common in econ to pull the coefficient for that variable and then check the significance. Uh, check the significance of that covariate against your entire population. And that's, that's just one technique. So that's a data-driven world. Uh, but that's, that's not the only, only piece here, right? We also have these philosophical foundations. And these are, these are broad topics that we also care a lot about and that we're gonna use math and stats to try and model in some capacity. And so first off, we have utilitarianism, right? Which is the basic idea that the only topic we care about or the topic we care the most about, if we're utilitarianists, um, is overall social utility. So if I have 100 people in the room and I have one person who's getting a utility of 3,000 from a given treatment, but the other 99 people are getting a utility of one, that's actually optimal uh, because the overall maximum utility for the entire society is the highest in that scenario. We're gonna contrast that with another technique that's called egalitarianism, right? Where the, the first topic we care the most about is equality which that first treatment we suggested, right, where it was, it was the 3,001, that's suboptimal, highly suboptimal, um, because we also care primarily about the equality. Um, I think it, it's gonna be interesting to see how we com can combine those two, because actually using reward functions, we can scale our outcomes to get really specific. Uh, but so egalitarianism is really important. Uh, Kantian rights, here we go, Kantian rights. Uh, when you think about the rights of an individual person and you think that these rights are inherent, these rights are long lasting, these rights can be applied in any other universal scenario. And then we try to not, uh, we try to not infringe on those rights, right? We uphold them and defend them. Then we also have libertarianism, of course, when we're, when we're concerned about the, the freedom of individual people and that's, that's the topic that's the most important. And so these are various philosophical frameworks that are used to analyze public policy and we can leverage those frameworks when we're building technology. We can actually design our machine learning models to inherit that philosophical architecture if you will, and then literally recommend policies that are based on those. And so in particular, uh, there's a gentleman named Pareto, so an Italian economist back in the day, and his concept, he wanted a Pareto improvement, which was the idea to help at least one person without making anyone else worse off. 
That's the goal, the Pareto improvement. And so my question for you today is, can we train our own Pareto? And I want you to think about this. I want my machine learning scientists in particular to think about this. Why can't we, right? What is stopping us? What is stopping us from actually designing an artificially intelligent agent who can help us determine public policy, who can look at as much data as we have, who can combine it against all the various philosophical frameworks that exist and actually scale it based on what the population really thinks and then retrain it based on perceptions in the population as they change over time. So an example that we're gonna talk about here is crime. Uh, crime is a big problem, right? Uh, gun control is a big problem. There are lots of people who feel very differently about this. Um, whether you're interested in using guns for entertainment purposes um, because you feel like it upholds your, your rights and you love that, you, you get a lot of utility out of that, um, or if you're sending your children to school and you're concerned about the safety of a public school, right? These are, these are challenging topics and there's no, there's no clear way, there's no clear answer um, for, for optimizing this, or at least there hasn't been. Maybe we can come up with one. So gun control policy, very specifically, um, is just one example of this overall solution. And so the data set that we're gonna have is essentially uh, 40 columns. Um, this is 40 columns that's coming from a state policy database that was produced by Dartmouth University. Uh, and essentially there are a variety of ways that states can control, um, can, can control gun control policy, right? Whether or not there's a concealed carry permit, is training required, a whole host of techniques. Uh, separately, we also have crime rates, right? Crime rates across U.S. states and how they've changed over time. So back in 1994, if you look at Washington State, uh, New York and Illinois, obviously New York and Illinois had higher crime rates. Washington State was a little bit lower, but then in that 10-year time period, we see a very dramatic drop, right? That is a very substantial drop. I mean, that is less crime overall in a 10-year period, which is really good news, right? That's good news across the board. What we want to understand is, well, what caused that? What was the causal mechanism that reduced that violent crime rate? And there's a lot of good ideas out there. Um, many, many economists have come up with, you know, really interesting uh, topics for exactly what caused that. What we want to be able to do is scale that across all years, all states, all policies. Some other key indicators. Uh, so if you look at household income, seems relatively comparable. Education, again, relatively comparable. Percentage above poverty, relatively comparable. You know, they seem, they seem pretty, pretty similar here. So if they are so similar, why can't we perform a randomized controlled trial? Why can't we perform that counterfactual analysis to understand the causal impact of a given policy? And so our solution leverages reinforcement learning for public policy generation, public policy suggestion, recommendation. Uh, the first thing we did was to collect data from both the US Census uh, and the FBI, pulling in crime rates, um, and then we looked at public policy data. And that public policy data, again, is coming from Dartmouth, and that is a state policy database um, that was produced by political scientists where they analyzed um, specific state-level uh, gun control policies, actually, and then produced a large spreadsheet with each of those states and the specific uh, levers, if you will, levers that the state was pulling in order to impact gun control in their state. And so we combine that with U.S. Census data, so socioeconomic indicators that tell us uh, general health, that tell us uh, income, that tell us uh, occupation, that tell us uh, you know, how much someone's paying for rent, how much they're paying for gas, how much time they're commuting to work. Uh, I've got about 120 variables uh, that explain this. So then we're gonna analyze and prepare that. And anyone who's been a part of a uh, data science project will know that that is the overwhelming majority of the work, right? Is actually just cleaning that data and getting it ready. Uh, then after that, we're performing counterfactual analysis. And so in our case, um, we're pre-computing thousands of regressions. Um, we're pre-computing thousands of regressions across all of the states. So it's an end by end comparison. So for each state in the United States, we're comparing it with every single other state in the US 
relative to some, some middle ground, right, based on some, some criteria. And what I want to do is open up this conversation so that we can get better at doing that. And by we, I mean we as a field, so that we can actually start to do this in a really large capacity. Uh, after that, we're going to frame uh, reinforcement learning experiments. So we're going to, again, feed the results of that RCT into a reinforcement learning agent. And then we're going to let, let Pareto train. Basically, we're going to let Pareto, who is our reinforcement learning algorithm, train by looking at economic vectors. So reading economic data from a specific state and then mapping that to a public policy suggestion, again, based on the data set that we have. And then after that, we'd like to evaluate it. Uh, we like to understand, uh, to, to Jeff's point earlier, we want to seek out uh, diverse opinions. Um, we want to see where we're wrong, right? We want to disconfirm these beliefs um, so that we can actually have a better system and have a better platform that's more personalized and more fun to use and, and leads to better outcomes. So with that. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Barun Rao Bhamidi Murray. I'm an enterprise solutions architect based out of Dallas, Texas. I've been with Airbus a little over three years. Uh, so what I'll be covering is uh, some of the services and tools we leverage in order to actually make this happen. Uh, so the first one is uh, the service called Amazon SageMaker. It's a service that we launched back in 2017, uh, reInvent, uh, which, is, which is actually our annual conference that happens in Vegas every year. Uh, it is a service that is really a cornerstone of our AI ML portfolio. And, uh, what we, uh, and I'm going to walk you through some of the key phases or key things within your, your uh, machine learning pipeline, like the build, train, and deploy, and how SageMaker, we leverage SageMaker to actually make that happen. I'm going to cover about eight different features to kind of highlight the, the, uh, the things that SageMaker provides. First one is the managed notebooks. So this is uh, the Jupyter notebooks that are managed as a part of SageMaker. Uh, it, it is something that you can go on, uh, uh, you know, log into the console, specify the size of the instance you need, and it spins up a Jupyter Notebook that you can go. Uh, and and for, for those of you who don't know Jupyter Notebook, it gives you the ability to kind of uh, write inline code, uh, get feedback. You can even share your notebooks uh, as well as like debug and things like that. Uh, second one is the 17 build-in algorithm. So SageMaker also, also supports about 17 commonly used machine learning algorithms. So think about this machine learning and deep learning algorithm. So examples of this is things like Blazing Text, uh, K-Means, uh, XGBoost, and things like that. But what we have done is we've taken those algorithms and I'm actually optimized to run on a larger data set. So this could be terabyte scale data set as an input, and then also runs at least 10x faster on performance. Uh, the next one is on the training side. So we did the build parts. We'll talk about the training now. So this is where uh, you, you, we, have, we have actually created a SageMaker uh, supports what is called a training endpoint uh, and an API. So you can literally take your training data set. Uh, you can specify the, the, uh, the algorithm you want to use. And this is either the 17 that we, we support or, all, or kind of you know, algorithm that of your choice. And then uh, specify the type of instance you want to use to run the training. And then, and then we take care of, or the API kind of takes care of creating the instances that are required, uh, setting up or downloading the code, and then running the actual uh, training. And once it's done, all that infrastructure that is used for training goes away. Uh, so, so just to give an example, like for our, for, our, uh, uh, for our reinforcement learning training, we actually used the RL estimator. So RL estimator is something that SageMaker supports. And uh, RL estimator has something called a fit function. So each of these estimator part of the training has a fit function, uh, has a predict function, and has a deploy function. So I'm going to talk about how it actually, uh, what it does behind the scenes. So uh, when I call fit, that's when the training happens. Uh, hyperparameter tuning is the other feature as a part of the training, which gives you the ability to like uh, tune your hyperparameters automatically. Uh, so an example of that could be XGBoost binary classification, uh, where you want to optimize on your area under the curve, and there's different parameters. Uh, like max depth or minimum uh, weight of the, of the child nodes and things like that, or ETA or, or alpha. So those kind of things, you can specify a range of these values and then specify how many times you want to run it or how many parallel runs you want, you, you want to support. And then we figure out using a, a Bayesian optimizer to find the right set of those values of those parameters to come up with a, you know, the optimal area under the curve. 
Uh, next one is the deployment. So this is when you've done your build, you've done your training, now it's where you actually want to deploy it. So what happens is when, the, the, when going back to that estimator example, so RL estimator is one of the estimators, you call fit on it, that's when the training happens. Uh, once you're ready with the training, you call dot deploy, and what that does, it actually takes your model, your final artifact, and deploys it at a REST endpoint. So this is where the REST endpoint comes in. You can actually interact using HTTP calls. Uh, and what's nice about it is it actually uh, supports features like auto-scaling based on the number of requests, uh, and also supports things like you know, A-B testing. So you can do things like have uh, multiple models deployed on the same endpoint. Uh, you can have different versions of your same model deployed at the same endpoint, and have a way to kind of weigh the traffic between the two. So you can say 4060, 2030, whatever, or 2070, uh, 2080. So, uh, so that's where the, the deployment piece comes in. Uh, a few other things I want to highlight uh, is batch transforms. Uh, so, so you have the real-time estimators where you're actually making HTTP calls and getting, getting responses back, but you can also do batch transforms. So this is where you have a, a batch of records as input and you want to just do your predictions on it. Uh, you don't want to make this individual call, so you can actually send that to a batch transform function, and then it takes that input, creates the instance that are required, the right sizing it, and then actually runs the full transform and, and gets the outputs back. Uh, a few other things I want to highlight, SDK, so it does support both Python and Spark SDK. Uh, we did leverage the Spark side of things, I'm going to cover that in the next slide, but you know, uh, it does have uh, a capability to run SageMaker or call SageMaker APIs from your Spark code, so Spark Python or PySpark or Scala code, uh, and then you can actually interact with the SageMaker APIs with that. Uh, finally, you know the documentation and white papers and blog, pretty, uh, pretty well, uh, well written. There's a lot of uh, good information around all those 17 algorithms, how you optimize it, uh, what kind of instances that we recommend that you guys use when you're doing the training, what kind of instances you should, we recommend using when you're doing the deployment, uh, what are the different training uh, hyperparameters or tuning hyperparameters. Uh, and all that stuff, so it's very well documented in that. Uh, so the next one is really on uh, scaling it. So, uh, so, so as a part of the feature engineering and then kind of doing the data pre-processing, uh, when we had to scale this data set to about five years worth of data, uh, we realized we actually had to use some kind of a distributed uh, data processing system, and that's where Apache Spark comes in. Uh, so Apache Spark, uh, for those of you who know, um, is, is a, a, a distributed data processing engine. It is uh, it was something that was released back in 2011. Uh, Amazon EMR is, uh, is, a, is a managed AWS service which supports Spark, but not only Spark, but also supports about 18 uh, other open source uh, software or platforms like Hive and Presto and things like that. So we leverage Spark uh, extensively for doing the data pro pre-processing and feature engineering. A few examples of that is things like multiplying uh, uh, you know, uh, actually identifying or doing like string indexing or, and, you know, one-hot encoding on some of those categorical columns uh, or even multiplying the inflation to all the dollar values of, of the of, or dollar, dollar values that are found in the, in the uh, census data. Uh, just, just a few call-outs, uh, things like it supports, uh, it supports accessing data from S3, so a lot of our, all of our training data was actually sitting in S3. So this is the iPhones data, the crime data, uh, the you know the uh, policy data. All that stuff was actually stored in S3, and we used the uh, the 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 ability for Spark to access S3 natively uh, through Amazon EMR or uh, Amazon EMR. A few other things I want to call out: it does have the ability to uh, connect and process stream data, but also read and write to data warehouses, you know, NoSQL databases, so it's pretty feature rich. And uh, you know, some of the things like DynamoDB is one of the NoSQL databases you can actually interact with. Uh, last thing I want to call out before handing it off uh, to Emily again is the glue catalog capability. So with Spark, we were actually able to uh, process our data and catalog this uh, within what we call as uh, the AWS glue catalog. So this is actually a centralized place where you can uh, put your information or catalog information and have the ability to go search for it and then query against it completely serverless without having to actually have the infrastructure behind the scenes. Uh, so a couple of services there, which is the Glue Catalog and Amazon Athena, which is a managed Presto offering, which lets you like query it. So this gives you the ability to do some kind of data analysis on that without having to spin up the infrastructure behind. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I'm gonna hand it off to Emily. Awesome, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Great. So. Uh, 
20 seconds for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with how learning works typically. So from, from my standpoint, right in the machine learning world, we have a physical use case. That is something physical in the real world. That is rocket ships going into space. That is football players running down the road. That is inventory that's being updated. Those are robots rolling around in our centers. Um, and then so for any, any physical use case in the world, right, we're going to collect some data set. Sometimes we have that data set. Sometimes we need to acquire that data set. We're putting that data set into some type of model. And at the outset, we never know what type of model that is. We have some intuition. We've read some papers. We have some idea of what's going what's gonna to work out. But what we're literally doing is combining our model with our data set in order to reflect the use case. That's the goal. Right? We want the combination of our model with our data set to literally resemble the real world. And then when it does so, um, we can actually act prior to that event happening, which gives us a lot of power. That gives us a lot of ability uh, to respond um, for, for competent services, which is really great. In the reinforcement learning world, from my standpoint, uh, we still have our physical use case. Right? There's still some physical use case out there. Uh, frequently, it's digital. Uh, very, very common for, for video games, right, to be, to be optimized with a reinforcement learning engine. Uh, but the, the key difference here is that rather than model and data, which we'll still be using, um, but the two real drivers are actions and rewards. That's how our model is going to be learning. It's taking actions. It's taking its own actions. It's making its own decisions. And then we as the architects of that system need to figure out what the rewards are for each action. And there lies the rub, if you will, right? That's the, that's the hard part, is figuring out what the reward is going to be for your action and whether or not the combination of those two can actually reflect your use case, can actually provide some serious learning for your system. So to, to break this down a little bit further, right, we're going to take a look at our, our handy-dandy Bellman equation. This is, this is standard for um, a topic known as dynamic programming or recursive functions, right? This is, this is not new, um, but this is a helpful thing to understand. So first off, there are states. And in this case, this means the state of our agent. And the state of Emily right now is standing and talking, right? And if Emily needed to go down the stairs, the state of Emily would be turning and then walking and then on the floor. Right? Those, are, those are various states. Um, the reinforcement learning agent who's going to operate that needs to understand the utility or the relative value of every state. And that's where the learning actually happens. And so that is equal to a couple things. First off, we need the actual reward for every state. And that is a real number. That is a number that can be anywhere in the, in the world of real numbers, possibly in the world of imaginary numbers. Someone wants to wants to invent that. That'd be fun. Um, but yeah, so so reward per state. That is a real number. That real number goes into this function, right? And that is a real number. That's one, two, three, four. Anything we want. That is going to be added to. First, we have a discount factor, right? The discount factor is your gamma. That's your present value. That lets you understand the relative value of something of a big payoff in the future relative to where you are right now. So that's your discount factor. Then uh, we're going to do a for loop, right? That's your handy dandy little summation function right there. We're going to loop through adjacent states. So the adjacent state for standing Emily is turning and then walking and then leaving. Um, and so those are all the adjacent states. And so our function um, in the reward function is literally looping through each adjacent state. Then it's computing the transition value, right? And the transition value is some function of the state we're currently in, the available action in that state, and then the adjacent state, so something that's next to it. So we'll get some transition value, but then uh, we're going to make a recursive call. Right? Then we call the same function on that adjacent state. And so that's how, if you're designing a reinforcement learning system to populate a map or to make a decision through time, um, that's typically how that's going to be happening, right, is with some variant of your Bellman equation. In our case, our reward function combines two very different disciplines, actually, which is, which is why it's kind of interesting. So on the causal inference side, we're looking at different states. These are US states, right? So we have the state of Illinois, and we're comparing it with the state of New York, for example. But there are actually over 1,000 comparisons that we're doing. And then we're asking ourselves, are they similar? 
Are these troops, two groups similar? In particular, can we run a causal inference? Can we say that these two groups are nearly identical, not just on our covariates, but on everything else that possibly happened? And this is why it's challenging to scale uh, economic analysis, right? Because causal inference estimation takes a long time. Um, it takes a lot of domain expertise. You need to know, were there intervening events? Were there fundamental differences between the two groups? Was there some assignment mechanism that was, that was incorrect in creating both the treatment and the population groups? And so it's really challenging. You need to use logical reasoning. There's just no way around it. What I wanna know if we can do is actually use a machine learning model to handle this, right? If we're literally gonna be running 1,000 RCTs, why not pull a subset of those RCTs, feed them through the ground truth labeling system, and then actually have economists and people who live there tell us if it is causally valid to compare those two groups. So that's, that's where we would like to go. After that, right, so separately, uh, we have Pareto, and Pareto is actually a deep learning model. So this is a deep learning model that's mapping economic variables to a policy suggestion. So that's just a deep learning network. In our case, that's an FS, uh, FC net um, that's actually based on MRI scans, just for fun. Uh, but so that reads in economic policy vectors, and then that maps those vectors to a policy suggestion. So it maps it to one of those 44 levers that a state can potentially pull in order to impact gun control. Then the simulator, right, so then Pareto so, so Pareto suggests a policy. The simulator looks at that policy and it looks at that state, so the specific state for that specific policy. We're gonna pull a regression. We're gonna pull the results from a regression that we ran over here. So we pull the results from that regression and then we use the estimated effect of that policy as our signal. Right? We actually use the beta itself. We use the T value of that beta, and then we scale it by the T value between the two groups. And that is just the first pass, right? And the beauty about reward functions and the beauty about math is that we can include a lot of people and we can be highly transparent about our methods, highly transparent about our reward functions. And in particular, individual people can do this themselves. Right? A single person can determine what reward function they want to use to train their own system. And actually, if you have 200 people and you're trying to figure out the optimal policy for those 200 people, if half of them want outcome A and the other half want outcome B, then you just weight the reward function, right? You do outcome A times 0.5, outcome B times 0.5, and then you throw that into Pareto. And Pareto is actually cognizant of both of those. Pretty cool. All right, so now we're gonna open this up. And so this is the AWS console. Um, for, for folks in the room, if this is your first time, welcome to the AWS console. Uh, we, we tend to spend a lot of our time here. Um, these are the, the host of services that we're gonna be leveraging. Let's go ahead and navigate to SageMaker. And so as Varun was telling us earlier, SageMaker makes machine learning a lot easier. Right? Rather than the undifferentiated heavy lifting of turning on our EC2 instances, installing our databases, cleaning our data, restoring it, spinning up a separate instance for a training job, and then deploying it somewhere else, we can actually spend most of our time in SageMaker, uh, which is a managed service. So it's gonna be uh, taking care of that undifferentiated heavy lifting for us on the back end. And so there are a number of notebook instances that we have, uh, and now we're gonna navigate to one of those notebook instances. Uh, and so we're actually here gonna take a look at the reward function itself. Uh, so this is one of our notebooks, and this notebook, uh, so this is the function that Pareto interacts with, right? So when the results of that deep learning suggestion come out, um, this function is capturing that. So that's a specific year, that's a policy ID, and that's a state. So the state could be the state of Alabama, or the state of Florida, or the state of California, or whoever inter is interested in using this for a specific year and a policy ID. Once that happens, we pull the relevant RCT. So we pull the randomized control trial that is relevant to that suggestion. And once we do that, one of two things is gonna happen. Either that, uh, either that policy happened historically, 
And if it did, then it's great because we can just read it directly. Uh, but if it did not, um, then we're actually going to look at a similar state who did have that policy, and we'll pull those results and then scale it. And if neither of those two conditions happen, then we just can't support that analysis right now. Uh, and then once we get the relevant RCT, uh, we read the results table, and then here's our reward function. Right? And the reward function is actually not too bad. So it's literally just the treatment beta times the treatment T value. We'll take the log of those guys, then we'll divide it by the absolute value of the similarity between those two groups. And I'm opening this, opening this up for feedback, right? I want experts, I want both domain experts and scientific experts to collaborate with me and to engage with us so we can help make, make this system more rigorous. Okay, let's, let's check out the next one. So that's what Pareto is interacting with directly. In order to support that, um, we run, ran a large number of regressions. And so this is a pre-computation system. And so the steps for the pre-computation look like this. So first off, uh, we're actually getting meta distributions in this case. We're just taking averages. We're just taking averages for the states. And again, if you think that's too simple, please email me and we can, we can come up with something that's better. Uh, then we're gonna look at the n by n state meta comparison distributions, right? So that's all my 50 states times all my 50 states, right? Because I wanna know uh, the state of Illinois against every other state that I can possibly run a valid regression for. And I wanna learn from each of those because each of those is gonna be slightly different. So it is n by n. Uh, so then I have my pairs. And my pairs are my valid RCTs. So I have pairs of valid RCTs. And for each pair, I'm gonna do a couple things. We're gonna run a t-test, right? We're gonna run a regression, and then we're gonna store those t-test and regression results. And my friends, this is where if you're an economist and you wanna help me automatically understand whether or not two groups can be causally valid, this is where you're gonna spend most of your time in labeling these sets and looking at them and understanding can we make a causal argument between those two groups? And let's actually create some labeled data. Right? Let's actually create a machine learning model who is capable of understanding this. And let's get whatever data we need to make it happen, because it's a really important problem that a lot of people are depending on us in order to solve. Great. Uh, so we'll take a look at, just keep going down. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is how we actually run the regression. And in this case, um, the outcome column can be poverty. Right? The outcome column can be any of those covariates, right? any of the outcomes that we actually care about, any of those socioeconomic indicators, or some combination of them. Right? You can just plug it in, plug it in. So then after that, uh, we grab the regression data. And so that's literally just a read from the, from the data frame. Uh, then obviously we're gonna do our get dummies, like always. Um, and then we pull out the Y, right? And the Y is that outcome target. That is the uh, outcome column that we're most interested in. And then the X's are everything else. The X's are all the other data that's sitting in that set. Uh, we're gonna add a constant here because we're doing OLS and we like constants. And then the next one is OLS, right? And that's just coming straight from Python. So we just run a regression right there, OLS.fit. Uh, we get our model. Um, the, the model here actually comes out with this really large uh, string set, so you have to just parse through that and clean it up a little bit. So this is that. Uh, then we get our treatment beta and the t-value on that guy and send it back. And so that is happening every single time Pareto is suggesting a new policy. And so let's take a look at our regression table. So this is the result of that pre-computation, right, where we have each state so state one, that is a treatment state. And that is being compared with state two, which is the control state. And then so for each of those, we have a treatment beta. And so that is the actual impact of that policy. And then we have the T value on that beta, so the significance of that impact. And then we have the T value for the similarity between the groups. So we know if they're really far afield, and by the way, if they're far afield, then we can't run a regression, and there are many state-by-state -state comparisons where we were not able to support regressions, and eventually we'll come up with a better method for doing that, but in this case, the states were, too, were simply too different. Um, so we, we weren't able to do that in this case. But all the ones that we were able to are listed right here. 
And then, now let's take a look at a Pareto training job. So let's actually just scroll through this here. Let's, let's just give them a view. So we'll slow down here for a second. So for each point in time, so this, this is CloudWatch. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is CloudWatch. This is reading the results of all of your cloud resources in AWS. And in particular, uh, one of the nice things about SageMaker is that when you train a model on SageMaker, on that cluster that spins up for the life of your model, everything that's happening to your model is getting sent out to CloudWatch. So if you're using a built-in algorithm, we're managing the write to CloudWatch for you. If you bring your own model, then everything you write to standard out, so just every print statement wrapped in your model is sent over to CloudWatch automatically. And so in this case, um, we have, so for each point in time, Pareto is reading a economic vector and is mapping that to a policy ID. So it's mapping it to one of those 44 columns that we started with in our data set. And in this case, it's the state of Alabama. Uh, that's the relevant year that we're looking at. And then for each point in time, he just has to read from the results table, right? So he just pulls in the reward, which was that function that we looked at previously. So he reads in the reward for that. And then we also have the crime reported here um, because that's, that's, that's a core part. Um, eventually in our system, we're gonna want it to optimize on, the, uh, on a change in crime. So we want crime rates to be low, um, still an active area of conversation about what the best reward function will be, um, but lowest crime should certainly be in there, or, or the highest delta crime, so the highest reduction in crime. That'll be in the reward function, um, but so for right now we have these reported, and let's just keep scrolling um, just, to, just to show. So this is Pareto training, right? So for each point in time, um, he's just suggesting a new policy ID for the state of Alabama, which then comes back with a different reward function and a different outcome. And so this is, yeah, this is, this is our system. Um, again, very early stages, very early days on this. We wanna, wanna put this idea out there, get some feedback, see what we can do to help, to help improve this. Great, so along those lines, um, the reason I'm excited about the solution is because I see it as a way to improve both transparency and collaboration in public policy analysis, right? Potentially, this is a way to actually open up insights to the very mechanisms that our policy engines are striving for, right? To literally put that in the hands of every single person who is a citizen, every person who is impacted by those policies, because it can tell you that all the 300 million people who live in the United States, each of us are impacted by policies in different ways. Most of us don't know about this, right? Most of us can't whip out our phones and see what the impact of policies are, right? We have to do this research on a case-by-case -case basis. It's highly political, it's highly dogmatic, it's very challenging to come up with an objective criteria. And even when you have one, it's difficult to collaborate. It's difficult to build a uniform mechanism that's gonna be you know, widely adopted by multiple people who have diverse perspectives. So along those lines, we'll talk about specific applications in policy and industry. So how would this work in practice for democracies? Right, so the first thing is that any type of automatic data analysis is really, really valuable. And that doesn't matter if you are in a corporation or if you're in a startup or if you're in any type of organization. Having automatic data analysis improves the intelligence of your operations simply by the quality of the data and by your access to that data. Right, that's just how it works. Objectivity, we like objectivity. We can do science on objectivity. We can create technology on objectivity. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we want more objectivity. Uh, having a baseline recommendation, right? Having a baseline recommendation that is obvious, that is clear, that is, is transparent. Uh, and human in the loop is an important, important technique, right? Any, any system should be assisting, um, assisting the people who are already tasked with, with making those decisions, but helping make that decision be easier, more obvious, um, and again, more transparent. And then, um, we want our policies to be at least as intelligent as the data we have, right? That's, that's something that we should have as a baseline, is that every policy that's suggested should be cognizant of the last 10, 20, 30 years, right? As much data as we have. And if we can do that automatically, then let's go for it. So here's my call to action for you. So for my scientists, my analysts, my researchers in the room, we want to work with you. Please email effectivepolicies at amazon.com. Right, again, open source research project. 
Uh, if you are an economist and you can think of 17 reasons why my similarity analysis is bunk, email me. If you have 13 other RCT evaluations that you want to do, email me. Uh, if you're a machine learning person and you can come up with a better model, um, if you think that there's another way that you can really interestingly do this state-by-state -state comparison, again, drop that email. Uh, software devs, if you want to help us build out an open source library that's complete with the front end and all the bells and whistles, shoot me an email. Um, there are existing limitations with our system today, right? This is, this is science and tech, so we're going to talk about limitations here. So first off, we need more logical reasoning for causal inference validity. Right? It is just challenging to uh, scale that out. So we need more logical consideration of the causal validity of our events, particularly if there are intervening events or fundamental differences. On top of that, we need ways to model interstate effects. Right? I live in Chicago, and many of the guns that come into the state of Illinois, as is well known or as is well hypothesized, come from Indiana or come from other states in, in nearby regions. And so we need ways to, to handle that in our, in our model. Um, we need to be able to handle differences in treatment from the federal government um, or, or other sources, right? If there's some other uh, mechanism that's treating both of those two differently, we want to be able to account for that. Uh, we'd also love to be able to handle mental health, uh, mental health levels, mental health policies. That's, that's a, obviously a core part of, of any, any solution. For my, for my commercialists in the room, if you work at a company and if you're thinking, you know, man, this sounds a lot like some other workload I have or some other problem that I have, uh, shoot me an email. We, we definitely want to work for you. We are actively looking for small scale opportunities to experiment, right? If you have a rich collection of available actions for every decision that you made, uh, if you have the ability to sample from similar populations, where you can break each one into a treatment and control group. And ideally, if you have the flexibility to implement recommendations that were actually made by our model under safe conditions. And then lastly, um, our soon to be released open source software. Um, how can you get started with it? So the first thing you want to do, as always, is collect, clean, and analyze your data. Right? That, is, that is step one. Uh, step two is breaking up your treatments, your population groups, into treatment and control. Uh, step three is determining your causally valid experiments, right? Challenging thing to do. Number four is picking your reward function. And again, keep it transparent. Keep it something that people can have a conversation about, that they know why it matters and that they know that they need a voice and that, in particular, you want their voice. Uh, and then lastly, build a simulation environment. Um, that's going to let you model both what happened historically and what did not happen historically, again, scaling um, by the similarity between the groups. And so with that, um, these are the sources of our data sets, uh, IPUMS, Dartmouth, uh, FBI, and thank you very much. We're going to open this up for questions. <laughs> All right, and so as we open the floor for questions, we have seven more minutes. For, for questions, let's, let's keep this apolitical, uh, please. We're, we're not going to have any political questions here, just, just purely, purely scientific and tech. Sure. There we go. Should we come up to the microphone? Oh, please. Okay. So I was wondering how you factor in um, personality differences of different states and how um, like a policy that might be good for one state might not be right for another state, which is probably why they live there. Yeah. <laughs> like what do, how do you factor in the human differences? Yeah. So that would come into kind of how we're determining those causally valid groups. And we would want both, say, like, economists to help us figure that out, but also folks who live there, right, who kind of know if the two groups are fundamentally similar versus different. And if they are fundamentally similar, then we can run those RCTs. If they're not, then we just can't. And we need to do another type of RCT. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll just keep it quick. Um, well, I guess first question is, do you guys have any, like, white papers that we could maybe look over and just, Take a look okay. next yeah, I mean, I think, coming, yeah. coming months, but yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, anything that would make it easier to, I guess, look over, yeah, just all the mathematical bits and things. Um, um, I think I have probably a more complicated question that's better offline, but just to keep it short, um, so the number of policies, you said there are 44, did I so, get so that correct? So there are, okay. so from the state policy database, there are 18 
separate policy areas. And by policy area, I mean okay. gun control, marriage, fiscal policy, um, affirmative action, okay. um, all, all sorts of things, education. Um, and then within each of those policy areas, basically what you need is a spreadsheet. What? Yeah, so those are, those are the different policy areas that are publicly available. And then, uh, Varun, do you want to switch over to the spreadsheet just so we can, we can see it if it's, if it's on there? Yeah, so yeah, that, that's great. what that actually looks like. Right, so that is each row is a state. Interesting. And then we have years, and then that's just the data that's available for that state, and that is within firearm policy. Okay. And so each column is a different element. So it would be like the bill obviously gets passed as a document, and then you need either a person or a machine learning model to read through that and then map that to discrete items. Okay. Um, and then we need to uh, synthesize that across states um, so that they mean the same thing across every state. And so the columns are the action space for Pareto. Cool, awesome, because I'll have to look into it. Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. Hi, thanks. Uh, just uh, thank you for the presentation. Great stuff. I'll start with, I have a question, but I'll start with a compliment. You're the very first person in machine learning that I've seen start with philosophical models and integrate that into their, into their modeling. So thank you for that. That was fabulous to see that. And then the question is, I'm in the private sector. I typically am seeing a huge volume of interest and engagement and uh, experimentation with machine learning. My perception is the public sector is way behind. Is that the case, or are you seeing a volume of experimentation in the public sector at state, local, or federal levels? Yeah, so my master's degree um, is from the University of Chicago where we studied both public policy and computer science. Um, so there's definitely a growing interest in, in uh, leveraging uh, machine learning, data analytics in a variety of capacities, um, and there are a number of customers in multiple areas who are interested in that. Okay. But in terms of what AWS is seeing, are you seeing a lot of state, local customers coming in and kind of doing activity? So my, my day job is actually commercial side. Um, I'm, a, I'm a commercial okay. SA, and I'm interested in public policy, um, but I'm not, gotcha. I'm not uh, in, in that area directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How are you handling um, systematic data problems? So there are a large number of there's a large amount of data in like the Bureau of Prisons, jails, and so on that are getting the information incorrect. And so if you're generating policies based on that data, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, so first off, um, the, the only data set we're using right now is the three that we've identified. So that's the US Census, um, it's the one coming from Dartmouth, which is right here, and then it's one coming from the FBI. Um, I'm assuming all those three are ground truth, right? I'm assuming accuracy in those three. Um, for other data sources that I would be using, I mean, we'd, we'd probably handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, when we look into adding a different data set, certainly we need to look at the accuracy of that data set before we actually add it in to the system. Um, I think on the ML side, there's, there's certainly work that's being done in taking a large data set, handling accuracies versus inaccuracies, within that. Um, also from the AWS side, I mean, we have conversations with customers every day about what's called a data lake, uh, which is essentially taking uh, the silos um, that are in, you know, taking your data silos across your organization and putting them in a single place where the information is accurate and you can run processing on it. So I think the cloud is also a, a part of that conversation because it makes data so accessible and so fun to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? All right, thank you very much and have a good flight home.